Okay. Um, today we've got Dr. Dave Hagen, who is the Dean of the College of Optics and Photonics at uh, University of Central Florida. He was my boss before I came here, so it's nice to, to see him. So he's going to give you guys a talk uh, um, on nonlinear optics. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, once again. I've been here quite a few times. Uh, uh, and it's great to see everyone. It's good to see a decent number of people come to the uh, colloquium. I, I hear you, uh, the students have to write something uh, as an assignment, so it sounds like a good idea. Anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, what I've been doing over quite a few years. Uh, I'll, I'll get to some of the new stuff at, at the end, but I'll, I'll build up and just uh, tell you a little bit about what we we've been doing over the years in the area of uh, nonlinear optics in semiconductors. And I'll show you, as I'll mention at the end, this is uh, the work of, I just put my name because otherwise there wouldn't be room in the slide if I put everybody on there that, that uh, deserves credit. So I'll, I'll give you a, a brief, I was told to, to give a sort of gentle introduction to this stuff, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what is nonlinear refraction and nonlinear absorption, and how that applies in semiconductors? I'll describe uh, what is two photon absorption, and particularly how that applies to, to semiconductors, and how we calculate that for semiconductors. And uh, of course, we're always interested in finding materials that have attractive properties for things like optical switching and so on. And I'll describe a little bit how it, it doesn't really matter which semiconductor you use, they're all kind of the same. Uh, but we'll get to that uh, la later. Uh, this led us to try some different things, particularly using uh, very non-degenerate two-photon absorption. So non-degenerate means uh, looking at the absorption of two photons of very different energy. And uh, that gives some quite large enhancement and, and then points us in some directions to do some slightly different things than just optical switching. Uh, for example, detection and imaging and uh, two-photon gain for potentially tunable uh, wavelength lasers. At the end, I'll talk a little bit about nonlinear refraction. Nonlinear refraction is very much related to nonlinear absorption. And uh, I've got a very short section at the end on uh, what can be called semiconductors or sometimes called uh, uh, transparent conductors. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, epsilon near zero. So this is a point where the uh, dielectric constant becomes very small and you get some quite large effects going on at that point. So I'll just quickly talk about that and if there's no time I'll just skip it. So just a little bit about Creole. What is Creole? Creole uh, started as the Center for Research and Education in Optics and Lasers and it was founded uh, 35 years ago at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Um, it started out as a research center, not, not perhaps so different from the Optical Sciences Center uh, many years ago here in Arizona. And in fact, uh, when, when we were building Creole, uh, we looked to Arizona uh, as a model for what we wanted to do. And uh, uh, it, it's worked very well for us. It's worked very well for you at, uh, as well. Um, so. In 2004, we, uh, having grown somewhat and become successful, we became a college. Just a few months before, uh, the College of Optical Sciences was, was formed, as it turns out. Uh, over most of these years, we did graduate education, uh, masters and PhDs. Uh, we only started a bachelor's degree about six, seven years ago, uh, and that's now a, a, a growing uh, program. Uh, we have about 34 faculty. We have joint faculty, you know, faculty working with us, but in other programs around campus. Uh, we typically graduate about 20 PhDs, 30 masters, and uh, right now about 35 bachelor's degrees per year, but the number of masters and bachelor students is, is growing quite quickly. Uh, we produce a lot of patent, patents. We uh, uh, bring in about $20 million in research, and we have an industrial affiliates program, which again I think was uh, somewhat modeled after the, the uh, affiliates program here. Uh, so that's a fairly long history, but our vision uh, 
throughout that time is to be the world's leader in education, research, innovation and partnership in the area of optics and photonics. Um, we have strengths in many areas. Uh, we do, you know, like here, we, we, we do many areas of optics and photonics. Uh, some of our major facilities are fiber optics fabrication facility, where we have fiber draw towers, uh, preform capabilities, uh, and so on. Uh, and we've got a lot of people working on applications of fiber, sensing, lasers, telecom, uh, imaging, uh, and so on. Uh, we have a laser range for, uh, it's an outdoor laser range uh, called TISTEF, that's out uh, uh, near where they launched uh, the rockets on NASA property. And that's a one kilometer, about to become a three kilometer outdoor laser test facility. We've got a large optical materials laboratory. We have a, quite a strength in the area of optical materials at Creel. And coupled with that, we have uh, some uh, pretty good nanophotonics and integrated photonics fabrication. And IFAST is the Institute for, if I can get this right, Frontiers of Adisec and Science and Technology. So uh, the world's shortest ever pulse of light, probably pulse of anything, I guess, uh, is 53 attoseconds generated by Zengu Chang's group in, in IFAST. And generally, you know, we have all, all these facilities, but our, our major asset is our, our faculty. We've got strong faculty in a broad range of optics and photonics. Uh, we're reasonably highly ranked. And one thing I've noticed, you know, we went from a young institution to beginning to mature. Now we're at the age where we now have quite a number of our alumni are leaders in the optics and photonics industry. Uh, it takes a while uh, for you to get to that point. Uh, Arizona, I think, has been in that situation for a long time. And we have an affiliates program. We've got very strong connections with the photonics industry. And I mentioned we uh, about, have about 30 plus faculty. Well, that's going to be uh, changing soon because we have a major expansion underway where we're going to be hiring something like 10 new faculty in the next, uh, well, the university wants us to do it in two years, but uh, it's probably a little bit unrealistic. And we also have several endowed chair positions as well. So that's going to change us uh, in, in several ways, but uh, that's uh, still to come. So anyway, that's a, a little bit about Creole, and now back to the, the main subject of the talk, which is nonlinear refraction and absorption. So uh, when I was a grad student, I had a, a roommate who was a chemist. And he asked me, well, what is nonlinear optics? Because I thought light always goes in straight lines. So, uh, so then I tried to explain to him that the nonlinearity the non is in, its, in the sense of linear systems, nonlinearity in, a, in the, uh, if optics is a linear system, it doesn't matter how much light is going through, the properties are the same. But in nonlinear systems, the more light you put in, the more the properties of the material will change. So you can imagine you put in an intense laser uh, with strong electric fields that may modify the properties of the material. I'm not going to really talk much about the fundamental materials properties in, in that respect today. But, but uh, often you characterize the, the nonlinear refraction with a, uh, a coefficient, N2. So the linear refractive index would be N0. But as you turn up the irradiance, uh, you can change the index. And so N2 is the coefficient of uh, change of index, if you like. And similarly, absorption can change. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so typically, the, the, the delta Ns that you will see are usually quite small. But remember, just a, a, a small index change, if you propagate uh, a millimeter or so, that can make a, a big difference. Uh, absorption is, is slightly different, of course. Uh, all materials, I need to be careful there, most materials always have an index. Uh, so a small change in the index uh, is a perturbation. Uh, but in the many wavelength ranges, materials may have no absorption. So any change in absorption is quite significant. So alpha 2 is often known as the two-fold absorption coefficient, although there can be other mechanisms for that. And that's, that's just a, a simplification. This is sort of simplest way of describing nonlinear refraction and absorption. Uh, it's not always instantaneous. Here I said it follows the uh, time dependence of the irradiance. Maybe I forgot to mention I is the irradiance of light. But uh, often the refraction is non-instantaneous uh, and you have to have some sort of response function to describe that. Uh, often the absorption uh, 
you know, if you get some absorption, there can be excited states formed, and that will change the absorption spectrum of the material. So again, that is a complication I'm not really going to get into uh, today, but we need to be cognizant of that. Just because you measure a change in refractive index, it doesn't always, it isn't always described by a simple N2. Uh, so applications, why do you even care about this? Well, if you can change the refractive image of a material by shining light on it, then of course you, can, you have the possibility of uh, modulating one light beam with another or switching like one light beam with another. Uh, so for optical processing and switching, there's, there's always been a desire to do this. The idea, well, it's ultra fast and so on, and uh, people always talk about how silicon is going to uh, run out of steam at some point, but of course silicon just keeps, keeps on going. Uh, but there are niche applications uh, coming up now where uh, doing uh, switching and processing all in an all optical manner makes uh, some sense. Uh, another application that I've worked on for, for ma many years is optical limiting. So if you have uh, a material that's transparent, but when you shine the light on it, it becomes somewhat opaque, uh, then that's a nonlinear optical device as well. So uh, you can get photochromic uh, coatings for your eyeglasses and you go out in the sun and they become dark. Well, that's a nonlinear optical device. Uh, however, there's a very, very slow nonlinear device and it doesn't change its transmission much. So what we'd be looking for is ways of using nonlinear optics to change the transmission very, very quickly and by a very large amount so that you could protect your eyes from a high intensity laser beam, for example. So these are just some examples. Uh, uh, and over my career, I typically work with semiconductors, organics, uh, plasmonic materials, nanoparticles. Uh, we're even looking at semi-metals these days. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what uh, the result of N2 is. So if the refractive index increases with increasing irradiance, that means, remember, an increasing refractive index means the light slows down, okay, because that... Uh, that's what the refractive index tells you. So imagine you've got a beam. Most beams are bright in the middle and weak uh, in the wings. Uh, so if you've got a beam like that, and it's got a plane wave and it goes into a nonlinear material, as you turn up the irradiance, you get more of an index change. That slows down the light in the middle. Actually, is there a laser pointer here? Ah, well. Uh. Oh, okay. Okay, so that, 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 that's, that's fine. Anyway, well, actually, it's not fine. <laughs> I got a pointer here. So uh, I lost my thread now. Yeah, so, so the light slows down in the middle. It's, it's behaving like a lens, and the, 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 the beam will uh, curve and focus. So you, yeah, that can be a small effect. You get a little bit of focusing. But if, uh, if the material is uh, optically thick, you've got a long propagation length. Of course, there's a positive feedback effect that happens there because if the light focuses, it gets more intense and uh, thanks Ken. and if it gets more intense then you get a stronger effect and pretty soon uh, the beam gets brighter and brighter you get stronger and stronger self-focusing and uh, pretty soon that can lead to catastrophic optical damage and of course that's a major source of problems in high power uh, laser systems but uh, remember, light wants to diffract and spread out. Self-focusing prevents that. There are certain circumstances uh, where you can get optical nonlinearities that will cause what's called spatial solitons to form, where you can exactly balance the effect of diffraction and nonlinear refraction and get beams that beat the diffraction limit. Uh, so and, and the, the, there are other applications. I'll talk about one more in a, in a second. Self-defocusing doesn't really do much because it's un unlike the positive feedback effect of self-focusing, self-defocusing, the beam just gets uh, dimmer uh, or, or, or less, less intense. Uh, it could be used to counteract the effects of uh, self-focusing if you could arrange it in that way. However, it turns out very few materials exhibit uh, self-defocusing. Most exhibit self-focusing, as it turns out. Um, there's a few other applications. One, one down, down here in the corner I just wanted to, to mention is sort of the time domain equivalent of, of self-focusing. And if you think about a short pulse going through uh, a nonlinear refraction me medium, which is instantaneous, the irradiance is changing in time. So if the irradiance is changing in time, that means the index is changing in time, which causes the phase to change in time. And a phase that changes in time corresponds to a shift in the frequency. So when you got 
And you, uh, here, I might get this wrong, you get an upshift followed by a downshift. That means part of the light becomes redshifted, part becomes blue shifted, and this results in what's called supercontinuum generation. And so you can uh, quite easily go from an input that is fairly monochromatic to one that is uh, very broadband. And uh, that's got a lot of interest for white light sources and so on, spectroscopy. So these are some of the things that you can do uh, with nonlinear optics. Uh, but let me go back to some of the fundamentals and talk about two photon absorption. So linear absorption just means that you got a, a, a photon of light, uh, is absorbed, it, it, it interacts with the material, and can excite uh, from the ground state of a system up into an excited state. But here, as we show, uh, the photon energy isn't the right photon energy to make a transition. So you can't have a transition, so there's no absorption, uh, or no linear absorption as such. However, uh, that's not completely the end of the story because uh, there's something called uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So delta E, delta T uh, must be greater than H bar or H bar over two. Uh, we won't be too picky about that. So you can actually say, well, maybe there is a transition to uh, state one, uh, but of course there's not energy allowed. But you don't have to care about the energy for a certain amount of time, which is just given by H bar divided by the energy difference. So, so that you can call this a virtual transition. Sometimes you can say the material is in a sort of light matter virtual state. Uh, but the upshot of that is if another photon comes in in such a time that the second photon gives enough energy to get to one of the real states of the system, then you can have an absorption. Uh, but that has to happen within this very brief time, which is given by H bar divided by the detuning between the photon energy and the energy state of the system. Uh, this is a loose way of speaking, but actually it's, it, when you calculate it, it's exactly, uh, it's exactly what happens. Uh, so, uh, and then if you do that, then you have two photon absorption. So this is kind of how you can have uh, two photon absorption. And of course, the smaller the, this detuning, uh, the stronger the two photon absorption. So anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Talk, talk quickly about how we do measurements of uh, nonlinear refraction and nonlinear absorption. In the picture, there's Mansur Sheikh Bahai. He invented this in our group when he was a postdoc. Uh, he's now a distinguished professor at University of New Mexico. And basically what you do is you take your beam, usually it's pulsed light, you take that beam and you focus it, and you don't change the brightness uh, or you don't change the energy in, in the laser pulse, but what you do is you take your nonlinear sample and you scan it from a region of uh, lower radiance uh, through the focus where the radiance is high and then back to lower radiance again. So here we've got a detector that is measuring the entire transmitted energy. So if you've got two photon absorption, then uh, you remember it's alpha plus alpha 2i. So when you get to a region of higher, uh, uh, higher radiance, you get higher absorption. And so if you look at the, the energy on the detector, you'll see a dip where the uh, sample is at focus because the, uh, the radiance is higher and therefore the absorption is higher. So this, with your, with, without anything blocking the beam, this is the signal that tells you whether you get nonlinear uh, absorption or not. Now imagine you get no nonlinear absorption, you want to measure the nonlinear refraction. What you can do is you can put an aperture in the beam and then you repeat the scan, but now Think about uh, self-focusing nonlinearity, and if the beam is already focusing, of course, if it's far away from focus, nothing happens. As it gets close to the focus, then the irradiance turns up, and it starts to focus the beam more. So you've got this converging beam. You focus it more. It focuses more tightly, and then it spreads out more in the uh, far field, so the aperture tends to block it. So you see a dip in transmission. On the other side of focus, the beam is expanding, and the self-focusing makes the beam smaller again, and so you'll see an increase in transmission. So if you see a decrease followed by an increase, that tells you you've got a positive or self-focusing nonlinearity. And, and of course, conversely, uh, if you had a self-defocusing nonlinearity, you just see a peak followed by a valley. So it's a very nice system that allows you to measure uh, both the absorption and the refraction simultaneously. And uh, you can do a little bit of theory. This is just an example of a material 
uh, that actually has nonlinear absorption and refraction. You can never really get away from nonlinear refraction, or very rarely. So the open aperture is the solid line here. When you have the closed aperture, now you, you can't turn off the absorption like I did in the example. It's still there. So now you get a mixture between the nonlinear refraction and the nonlinear absorption. So you get kind of a hybrid curve that includes the remnants of both. Turns out if you just divide these two curves, you will see the peak valley structure, which in this particular case corresponds to a negative or self-defocusing nonlinearity. Uh, so that's just an example. Uh, I picked that one because it's nice and clear. But this tells you you can do these two scans, and from the two scans, you pretty much get everything you need to know for this particular wavelength. Now, if you want to know the spectrum of this, you have to repeat these measurements at every wavelength. But I want to talk about semiconductors today, and this is kind of a, an old figure, but, but basically in semiconductors, you've got valence bands, conduction bands. Uh, you can make excitations like two photon, three photon, single photon. When you make excitations, you produce carriers in the conduction band. Then you can get free carrier absorption. Uh, you leave behind holes in the valence band. This allows you to get absorption from, uh, say, lower valence bands to the vacant states in the upper valence bands. There's a lot of things that can go on. And I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about all these carrier nonlinearities, but we have to be aware that these things are going on. Uh, what I want to focus on is two photon absorption and this would be this sort of situation here, where you're going from valence band to conduction band. And remember, I talked about the delta, the detuning. You can see, well, there's no, there's just an initial and a final state here. There's no intermediate state. So, uh, well, what does that mean? Well, it's still possible. Uh, you, you, you might think it's uh, two photon absorption is not allowed, but uh, in, in fact, uh, it is. And we don't need to look at the, the math here but you can look at these uh, arrows that correspond to the two photons. Uh, and this isn't proportional to photon energy. We could have two photons exactly the same energy, but you have to make uh, these two transitions. So now we say, well, again, uh, the first transition is from the valence band up to the conduction band. But of course, it's, again, energy disallowed, but it can exist for a very, very short time. But now uh, the detuning is huge. Uh, but... Uh, you can make the second transition just by, by a transition from uh, conduction to conduction band or from valence to valence band. And these are so-called forbidden transitions, but it turns out, as often is the case in quantum mechanics, forbidden transitions are not actually forbidden. Uh, and so it turns out two photon absorptions can be quite large in semiconductors. But that's how uh, you, you, uh, you get that uh, happening. And, uh, yeah, so... Uh, it turns out you can, uh, well, uh, 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 you, you can do this uh, perturbation theory that basically sums over all the different states using all the different bands, and you get uh, a fairly simple theory. turns out if you just assume there's two bands, you get most of the way there. So uh, let's see what, uh, what we get. Uh, I'll just uh, go straight to the, uh, the chase here. So, so here we can measure uh, the, the uh, we measure the alpha 2. So, and this is, uh, this didn't come out right, but, but this is just looking at the, the photon energy normalized to the band gap. So when the photon energy is equal to half the band gap, then two photon absorption can turn on. And we can plot this all the way up to the photon energy being equal to the band gap, at which point you get linear absorption. So there's a lot of stuff in here, but basically what we find is there's a spectrum, which we describe by F2. So the two photon absorption is given by this spectrum. This is the form of it here. But it's basically just this function. And it's a function only of the ratio of the photon energy to the band gap. So for any two bands, uh, you get the same sort of behavior. But of course, it scales uh, by these parameters that are more or less material independent, slightly dependent, and one over the band gap cubed. So it's telling you that the band, the band gap is very, very important. So small band gap semiconductors should have much larger two photon absorption than large band gap. So we want to measure that. And this work was done quite a long time ago. And back uh, in those days, we pretty much had uh, a YAG laser. And you could tune it by getting your one micron, or you could frequency double it and get half micron. You could frequency triple it and get, uh, and so on. But you get very few wavelengths that are available. Uh, and this is how the, uh, 
the, the lab looked back in those days. This is Tai Wei. You're going to see another picture of him uh, later on. He was a, a graduate student back in the early days of Creole. So you can't really easily tune the wavelength of the laser. So, but what you can do is you've got a theory for uh, uh, semiconductors that work for many different band gaps. And it turns out there's many different band gaps available, so similar semiconductors. And so what we can do is uh, we can look at, just remember, the, 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 the two-photon absorption coefficient depends on this F2 and the band gap. So basically, if we take the, the value you measure and multiply it by E gap cubed, then you can get a scaled value, which should be proportional to this F2 function. And so if our theory works, then all these different semiconductors with different band gaps should uh, uh, follow this F2 function, which it pretty much does. I mean, there's a lot of noise and, or, or, or uncertainty in these measurements. But actually, given that these are quite different semiconductors, it actually works quite well. We can also do the other thing. We can uh, say, let's, let's forget about the, or let's scale out the uh, spectral function and just look at the band gap dependence. And we can do that by just uh, uh, taking the measurement and uh, dividing it by uh, F2. And that should be proportional to 1 over the cube of the band gap. And if we plot that in a log-log scale, you see you get pretty good agreement. So these are the semiconductors I showed before. They've got band gaps you know, between about 1 and 3 electron volts. But indium antimonide has got about 0.1 electron volts. It actually works pretty well. There's a lot of spread in the, the data here. But nevertheless, uh, at, within an order of magnitude, it works pretty well, especially since the two-photon absorption coefficient is actually about three orders of magnitude larger for indium and timonite. And if we do look at some measurements of dielectrics, there's a lot more scatter in the data here. But roughly, roughly speaking, it, it can tell you the two-photon absorption in dielectrics as well. And this is just a very simple two-band model. Um, so what this tells us is, well, we've got a fairly universal uh, curve here that, that shows what's going on, it's actually difficult to en enhance two-photon absorption. You're pretty much stuck with what you've got. So let's look at something else which talks about intermediate state resonance. And this is all about that delta. Remember, we want delta be, to be small. So one approach is you say, well, let's work with organic chemists. And did that for many years. Bob, Bob uh, Norwood knows very well. And uh, uh, what, what they can do is they can play around with the, uh, the energy states and get materials that uh, do something like this. We'll have a, a very small detuning. Uh, but if you can't do that, then the other thing you can do is go to non-degenerate. And then you can choose the delta you want with the system you have. Because you can just change the ratio of the photon energy while keeping the sum the same. And you can get a much smaller detuning that way. So we did this first in uh, organics. And I uh, won't worry too much about what the or organic material is here. But it's got basically two fairly clear states. Notice they're quite broad. This is, this is kind of how it is with, with organics. But you've got your first state and your second state. So what we can do is a bunch of experiments that always have a sum of photon energies of 4 electron volts. So we're always uh, hitting the peak here. But we're going to change the relative values. So we change how far we are from this uh, first state, this intermediate state. And uh, so, uh, so we did that. And basically, I'll cut to the chase. We did this for four different values. And you can see the results are not very spectacular. You can go from uh, degenerate to almost the degenerate to fairly non-degenerate. And you get about an enhancement of factor four. The theory uh, works pretty well. But why can't you get higher? It's because the, the bands are so broad, you can't get to a very small delta before you run into linear absorption. So uh, what did I do there? OK. This is Joel Hills, the student uh, who did this. Uh, another postdoc, uh, Lazaro Padilla, uh, tried to do the same thing in quantum dots. So quantum dots are very confined semiconductors, such as the wave functions are, are so confined that you get discrete states. And he tried to do the same thing, such as in uh, lead, lead sulfide. You can perhaps have a small photon energy that's almost resonant with this transition, and the large photon energy is resonant with the, the band gap transition. And there we got a factor of five enhancement. So still not particularly good. And again, the reason is these states are quite broad. Uh, one of the reasons why they're, they're quite broad is the, the energy states depend very much on the size of the, uh, the, the particles. 
and there's always a distribution of sizes and shapes. So it's hard to do. So we did that. Uh, but let's go back to bulk and think about the same idea. So we can look at two photon absorption of very different photon energies uh, such that we're always getting across the gap. Now, if you just look at the state, we have two transitions. One is interband and one is intraband. So it makes sense that if you have a big photon energy that's close to the interband uh, transition and a small photon energy that's close to zero, uh, then you should get something that is more resonant. So uh, you can do the perturbation theory, and you basically see that, yes, in fact, you get these terms that dominate if h bar omega is very, very small. Uh, so I won't go too much into the theory. I think you get the idea. And uh, so this is what we call extremely non-degenerate enhancement. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll skip this. But basically, what, what, what it's saying is uh, it's behaving. Remember the E-gap to the, the third power dependence? Uh, it, when you use a small photon energy, it's kind of like being in a small band gap material. So I'll skip that, except to say maybe we can get the very, very large two photon absorptions we see in indium antimonide with large gap semiconductors, uh, such as gallium arsenide. So we did the experiment. In order to do the experiment, you have to do what's called a pump probe. So basically, you get your two different wavelengths. Uh, and pump probe means, basically, you have a strong beam that changes the, the behavior of the material and a weak beam that passes through uh, with some delay with respect to the, uh, the pump. And you can see what's going on as a function of time. So this is an example just of gallium arsenide. So if the probe comes through before the pump, you see no effect, of course. If the probe comes through at the, the, the same time as the pump, you see this very large two photon absorption. If the probe comes through after the pump, then you may see what's been left behind by the pump. In this case, the two photon absorption has created free carriers, and you can see free carrier absorption. And if you went to long enough delays, you'd start to see this decaying. And you can resolve the two photon absorption quite well. Basically, the cross correlation with uh, uh, or, uh, is here is just uh, something related to the sum of the two pulse widths. So you can get very high resolu temporal resolution here. And so you can be sure that you're looking at two photon absorption and not free carrier absorption. So uh, to do this, we had a slight, by the time we did this, uh, we had slightly more advanced. Uh, uh, technology where we have uh, femtosecond pulses and multiple parametric amplifiers that allow us to get independently tunable uh, uh, pulses. And then what we get, here's, here's silicon. We do pump probe in silicon. And uh, there's three things shown here. First, and this is again, the two photon absorption that's measured versus the sum of the photon energy. Actually, it's that the average of the photon energy. So 1 corresponds to the band gap, and 0.5 corresponds to half the band gap. So uh, this, again, is the degenerate measurement, just for reference. So you can see uh, for zinc selenide, you're getting two photon absorption coefficient on the order of 10. Uh, but you go non-degenerate, where you have a pump uh, that's below the two photon edge, and then a probe. Uh, as you change the probe wavelength, you start to see the two photon absorption kicking in, and you see uh, an order of magnitude enhancement already. Now, you can't go all the way up here because at this point, because the pump is a very long wavelength, the probe has to be that much bigger. So eventually, you run into linear absorption. And if you go extremely non-degenerate, now this is with a 5.6 micron pump, then you see a much bigger enhancement. There's more than two orders of magnitude enhancement of the two photon absorption here. So although uh, it's just a bulk material, the, the band gaps are actually quite clean, and it allows you to get much closer to the, non the extreme non-degeneracy point than you could with uh, quantum dots or with uh, uh, organic materials. So basically, we, see, we, we saw similar results in many other semiconductors. Uh, it's worked pretty nicely. Uh, in this case, the biggest we saw was uh, cadmium uh, telluride, where we uh, used an 8.5 micron pump, and we got 1 centimeter per, me per megawatt, which is about what you see in indium antimonide at 10 microns. So it really, the, the theory works. Uh, basically, it's telling you it's the, uh, the band gap dependence is really more a resonance dependence than anything else. So, uh, and of course, if you uh, put in 10 gigawatts per square centimeter, that sounds like a lot, but with ultra-fast pulses, that's actually not very much, then you can actually induce an absorption coefficient 
of 10 to the fourth centimeters. So you, you, uh, 10 to the fourth reciprocal centimeters. That means you're, you're basically getting a two-photon absorption that is about as big as the linear absorption across the band gap. Uh, that'll be significant uh, later. Um, one of the other interesting things you can do is uh, detection using this. Um, it turns out that the, the, the two-photon absorption is it's a nonlinear effect, it's proportional to I squared, but if it's non-degenerate, it's proportional to both the pump and the probe irradiance. So it's actually a linear in the probe irradiance. And so uh, there's a few things going on here. First of all, we just looked at the subgap absorption uh, or the subgap signal with a 390 nanometer uh, probe, and we put in a strong uh, mid infrared pump. And what you see is when the pump is on, the detector signal goes up by about three orders of magnitude. But that's not particularly interesting. There's plenty of ways you can measure light at uh, 390 nanometers. So what we did is flipped it around and said, well, let's do the opposite. In fact, I'll, I'll skip this uh, and I'll go just to the, uh, uh, the, the result. What we then did is say, let's uh, look at very, very weak 5.6 micron radiation uh, while we use a, a pump pulse or a gating pulse on the detector with, of 390 nanometers. So we just took a commercial gallium nitride uh, uh, detector, and of course you see nothing when the uh, 390 nanometers is turned off, but when it's turned on, you actually get a pretty good detection signal. And what's interesting is that, so the different values here are just different gate pulse uh, irradiances, but we compared this to a cooled mercury cadmium telluride detector, uh, and it's just a steering uh, detector. Uh, this is uncooled, and you can see the performance is similar, maybe even a little bit better. Uh, so you can actually get very sensitive detection. Well, why do you get sensitive detection? Well, uh, there's a lot of people here who know about infrared uh, detection. Of course, if you have a steering array, you're picking up a lot of background noise. Uh, you can reduce that by gating the detector, so you're only looking at uh, uh, for a short period of time. Uh, but this is gated by our 100 femtosecond pulse. So the amount of background radiation that is uh, received by the detector within 100 femtoseconds is extremely small, which is why the detector is very sensitive. But, of course, the downside is it only works when the two pulses are coincident. So there's a lot of limitations in this, but nevertheless, for some sort of applications, this uh, could actually be quite good. And uh, Dimitri Fishman was the postdoc working on that. Uh, he's now at UC Irvine. And he's actually taken this a lot further and actually trying to make uh, imaging systems using this technique. Uh, we did a little bit of work on imaging uh, because if you think about it, you measure the brightness of the signal coming back uh, off of the detector. You can get, or put it on your gated detector. You can also know something about the arrival time. So you can do time of flight imaging. And I won't spend too long on this, but basically we took an object, which is a coin, so there's a photograph of the coin, and here's a two-photon image just found by scanning it. So uh, you see a combination of brightness and arrival time on here. So you can actually do uh, sort of three-dimensional imaging using this. But the, the downside is you have to scan the uh, gating pulse back and forth in time in order to find out that arrival time. So uh, that's, that's, that's the negative of that. Uh, but again, this is a, a kind of interesting thing to try to do. Um, we also looked at, uh, can we do any better? And we thought about, well, in quantum wells, instead of having this zero frequency self-transition, in quantum wells, uh, you basically have, these are thin layers of semiconductor that give confined states. So uh, in, in certain uh, conditions, of course, you get defined states in the well, uh, they're actually defined bands, but you could think about uh, doing a large photon transition to uh, across the gap and then a small photon energy transition from one subband to another. And uh, of course, if you do that exactly resonantly, you just get linear absorption. But if you do it uh, with a slight detuning, then you would get what's called two photon absorption again. So uh, again, uh, there's some complications there that, that to, to couple to these subbands, you need light that is polarized, uh, the electric field is polarized across the well. So you need certain geometries to do that, uh, but that's what we'd get. This is the polarization that will give you this large two-photon absorption enhanced effect. 
and uh, we did some measurements on that using multiple quantum wells. It has to be in a waveguide geometry so that uh, the light can propagate. So the light would be propagating through the wells like this with the polarization uh, in this direction. The wells are in this direction. So now you've got uh, excitation across the wells that gives you this TM polarization. So uh, uh, we, we did these uh, experiments and again we used a, a long wavelength pump so that we don't get degenerate two photon absorption and uh, short wavelength probe and we got a result that looks like that. So remember before I showed the pump probe and you see this nice narrow peak. Here you get this very broad peak. But there's actually a reason for that. It's because we've got very, very different uh, uh, pump and probe photon energies. They're short pulses. They travel through the material at different speeds because there's a strong dispersion of the refractive index. So it turns out that there's a large range of different delays between the pump and probe where the, pro the pump will actually catch up with the probe and pass through it in the sample. And so there's many different options that will give you uh, a signal. The reason it gets smaller here is this corresponds to when the pump and probe are coincident on the front of the sample. This is where they're coincident on the back of the sample. There's some losses as you go through the sample. So you see a smaller two photon absorption effect on the, on, the, on, the, on the probe because the pump is just weaker at the back of the sample. So uh, that's, I think I've probably said that. I'll, I'll skip that one. If you, if you do everything right and just uh, do the calculations, it turns out you can fit this uh, uh, very well. It, uh, it's, uh, yeah, all you need to know is the dispersion of the refractive index and uh, exactly what I said happens. And uh, the other thing this tells you, you see this kind of exponential decay. This is telling you about the losses of the pump as it goes through the sample. So this is another thing that you learn from that. But from that, <coughs> we're fitting the two photon absorption coefficient uh, pretty much uh, uh, exactly. We do this for many, many different wavelengths, and we see uh, some data that looks... Uh, actually, if you look at it without the fits, it looks kind of like a mess. But uh, the solid lines here, so the solid blue line, we went from a two-band model to... This is Nick Cox. He just graduated uh, uh, on, on Monday. And uh, he... Uh, he does a lot of theory. So he's comparing here the eight band model, the 14 band model, they all kind of behave uh, pretty much as, as we would expect. There's some slight tweaks to that. Uh, but basically, you see, as you change the sum of the photon energies, you go from below the band gap up into the first subband, into the second subband. And so you really do see this. And this corresponds to uh, a pretty large enhancement of the two photon absorption. So we saw. Uh, two orders of magnitude enhancement over uh, uh, degenerate in the bulk, this gives you another order of magnitude enhancement. So the two photon absorption coefficient now is about 1,000 times bigger than it was when we started just looking at degenerate two photon absorption in bulk. And this is the TMTM. -TM. The TETE -E, uh, is uh, a completely different kettle fish. We actually don't understand the results from that. It somewhat behaves correctly, but we are off by a factor of seven. The previous ones, we've got pretty much exact agreement with theory. Now we're about a factor of seven off, and we still don't completely understand why that is. So you can get very large enhancement in, uh, in quantum well semiconductors. Anyone know what you use quantum well semiconductors for? One application? Uh, yeah, yeah, lasers, yeah. So, uh, so that, that made us think of uh, the, the, the next thing, which is two-photon emission. So this is kind of a weird thing to think about in semiconductors, but sometimes you think about weird things. You, uh, if, if they work, then uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So uh, two-photon, so you're probably aware that, that if you get linear absorption uh, in, a, in a system, if you invert the, the system so there's more population in the upper state than the lower state, you get... Uh, 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 spontaneous emission, okay, or, or you can get stimulated emission as well. But it goes from absorption to emission. Same thing with uh, uh, two photon processes. Uh, if you go from a regular system to a system that's inverted, so there's more uh, population in the upper state than the lower state, you can 
uh, get spontaneous emission of two photons. The probability of that is very, very low, but it can happen. I'll show you an example, actually. It's, uh, uh, it happens more often than you might think. Uh, and then you could also have a situation where you've got an inverted population. You can bring in one photon, and you'll get a stimulation of that if there happens to be a spontaneous emission at the other photon energy. And of course, the other thing is you just have an inverted system and you bring in two photons and you will get stimulated emission of both. That's doubly stimulated emission. And that's exactly kind of like the pump probe experiment that we did. You're just doing it on an inverted system and you should then see st stimulated emission in both wavelengths. So when do you see this? Uh, so it's just the inverse of, of two-photon absorption. So that's what we're going to look for. But just a little aside, uh, spontaneous two-photon uh, emission happens uh, universally, I guess you could say, uh, because it, uh, uh, this, here's something called the Blue Snowball Nebula. And for a long time, nobody knew what this blue light was. It's bluish whitish light. It's very broad band. So you, if you do spectroscopy in this, you'll see the discrete uh, lines that, that you expect. But then you see this broadband, longer wavelength that, that nobody understood. Uh, but it was uh, somewhat resolved and then uh, more completely resolved by Bright and Teller, see 1936 and 1940. Uh, that was around the time that two-photon absorption was discovered. And what they realized is this is just two-photon emission. So what happens is hydrogen can do all sorts of things, but this is atomic hydrogen. And uh, if you know anything about uh, some, some basic uh, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, a transition from 2s to 1s is not allowed. And these are atoms sitting in vacuum. They're not interacting much. They, that, that is a pretty much forbidden transition. It's not completely forbidden. It takes, uh, I think, uh, I think I've got it written here, but it takes uh, uh, a few seconds uh, uh, before uh, it, it can uh, decay. So, uh, but what can happen in the meantime is you can get uh, spontaneous two-photon emission, and that's how you get uh, this uh, broadband radiation. So it turns out that uh, two-photon emission is, is all around us, but albeit rather far away. And, uh, so let's look now at what you might do if you could take a laser material and invert the population. And of course, you could do exactly the same thing. Uh, you could get two-photon emission, but if you, if you now can do it non-degenerately, there's two things. One is the effect can be much larger, especially if you do it in quantum wells. Uh, the second thing is uh, just a slight change in the big photon energy can make a big change in the small photon energy. So we're thinking maybe this might be a way to uh, produce broadband tunable infrared radiation. So that's a bit of a stretch, but it's... Uh, it, it, it was good enough for a National Science Foundation to, to give us a grant on it. So, uh, and and it, it, it's, it's valid science, and it, it, was, it was a fun thing to do. So basically, it turns out that the two-photon gain coefficient is just a two-photon absorption coefficient, but now you put in these Fermi factors to describe the populations in the conduction and valence band. Before, we assumed everything is just in the valence band, nothing in the conduction band. And so just, you just flip these around. You can go from uh, negative to positive. Negative would be absorption. Positive would be gain. And so if two-photon absorption of 10 to the fourth per reciprocal centimeter is possible, then so is two-photon gain. Uh, the problem, of course, that I'm not going to talk about here is uh, you have a lot of uh, one-photon spontaneous emission. So how do you overcome that? There, there, are, there are schemes uh, that you might be able to do that. But uh, analysis shows that you might be able to do it, but uh, a lot of things might get in the way. Anyway, we decided just to do the experiment and say, Let's look at two-photon absorption in, uh, this was a piece of uh, gallium arsenide, just bulk gallium arsenide. We didn't do quantum wells at that point. And first of all, we just did a pump probe experiment. And although the figure here shows degenerate, actually, uh, it's strongly non-degenerate. And what we see is two-photon absorption. So basically, you just uh, see a decrease in transmission when the pump and probe are overlapped. Uh, but then we uh, turn on a pump that is enough to invert the population. We wait a couple of picoseconds for things to thermalize, and then suddenly what we see at that point with the inverted system is uh, we see the loss, which is indicated by a dip, 
going to gain, which is in indicated by a peak. So actually you get more probe light out uh, when the pump and probe are overlapped uh, than when they're not. So that's showing you that there's some gain. Now, there's a background of some free carrier absorption, so there's not actually net gain in this system. But nevertheless, it shows that it works. So uh, I think I'm yeah, pr probably out of time here. I'll, I'll just briefly mention... I'll just brief, briefly mention nonlinear refraction. Remember, the Z-scan tells you the sign of the nonlinear area, depending on whether you get valleys, peaks, peaks, valleys. So, we in the early days, again, here's a tunable laser. It's 10, uh, 1064 nanometers or 532 nanometers, and we looked at zinc selenide. And what we found is that uh, for one wavelength, we see positive uh, or self-focusing. The other wavelength, we see self-defocusing. And we didn't really understand why that was at the time. Uh, most uh, uh, inorganic materials showed uh, only self-focusing. So that was kind of a, a puzzle. Uh, so why does it change sign? Well, uh, oops, where, where are we? Yep. Uh, so just, just thinking about in linear optics, this is nonlinear, but thinking about linear optics, if you go through a resonance, uh, the, the, the contribution to the refractive index is, uh, it can be found by looking at the, what's called a tra chronic transformation of the spectrum of the absorption. What it tells you is below an absorption resonance, that resonance gives you an increase in uh, uh, refractive index. But at wavelengths above the resonance, you get a decrease in index. So, uh, uh, so you get this dispersion-shaped curve. Okay? Uh, but that's linear optics. But nevertheless, what we thought kind of naively, well, here we've got, we're looking at uh, a nonlinear process, nonlinear refraction, and we already know the nonlinear absorption uh, has kind of a resonance, it's not the same kind of resonance, but basically we found that in the transparency region below the two photon resonance you get a positive N2 and above you get a negative N2. So that kind of tempted us to try to do a Kramers Kronig transformation on the spectrum of the two photon absorption and I'm not going to drag you through that, I'll just show you the result. If we do that we get uh, a result that says there's this dispersion-shaped curve, G2, that describes N2. And if you divide it by E gap to the fourth, then with given one more or less material independent constant, this tells you the nonlinear refraction of the material. And lo and behold, for long wavelengths, uh, well below the two photon absorption, you see uh, positive nonlinear refraction. It peaks close to the two photon edge, and then suddenly it comes crashing down and becomes strongly negative. Uh, in the region of two photon absorption. And then we did our trick of scaling out the band gap dependence for all the measurements we made in all these different materials, and you can see it behaves pretty well compared to the theory. Down here are other measurements made by us and by others on dielectrics, again scaling out the band gap dependence, and yeah, there's a bit of scatter there, but it still gives you pretty much uh, the same sort of behavior. So this uh, is a fairly universal theory. Uh, and it looks even better, actually, if you uh, scale out the G2 function and just look at the band gap dependence. And now you see that you can go from, here's germanium at uh, a couple of electron volts. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, where, where are we here? Uh, okay, so less than an electron volt. You see a very, very large nonlinear refraction. You go down to, through all the semiconductors to glasses, and here's lithium fluoride with a band gap of about 11 electron volts. And you see that the nonlinear refraction is decreased by about seven orders of magnitude, well, uh, five orders of magnitude. So huge change, but it all, and this is a log log plot, so of course you can prove anything with a log log plot, but, but uh, it, it actually does work uh, pretty well. And so this is telling you that uh, not just semiconductors, but insulators uh, can be predicted by the simple two band model. So we actually know what nonlinear refraction of any material should be just given by the band gap. And the only other thing that goes into that K factor is the uh, refractive index. So, interesting, but it also tells us that you're not going to find a magic material with a huge nonlinear refraction unless you uh, try some different things. So, um, I'm going to quickly just say, well, we see very large uh, nonlinear absorption with, uh, in the non-degenerate case. So what we did is the uh, uh, kramers kronig relations and said, well, what happens to the refraction? So the dotted lines here are the uh, 2 photon absorption spectra for three different non-degeneracies. So 
uh, the, uh, the blue is some non-degeneracy, the green is more, the red is even more. And uh, what, what you see is that the, the two-photon absorption coefficient, as I showed you before, gets enhanced. Uh, the solid lines are the nonlinear refraction. Now, there's something to be noted here. The two-photon absorption is on a log scale. The nonlinear refraction is on a linear scale. So you see some enhancement as you go to much larger non-degenerates, but not nearly as much. So instead of getting a factor of 100 uh, enhancement, you get maybe a factor of 10. So, uh, so that works reasonably well. Um, I think I'll, uh, I was going to tell you uh, about the work we did to measure this. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. We basically developed a pump probe method for measuring nonlinear refraction as well. It's called beam deflection. But I'm going to skip past that because I think I'm getting uh, close to my time. And uh, I'll, uh, uh, well, let me just uh, skip out and I'll go to the, the last thing. It turns out that uh, you, we, we did a lot of uh, uh, measurements, the theory works, and so on and so forth. One of the interesting things, though, is although there's not a huge enhancement, what we find is if you just look at the, uh, this is just looking at the, the refractive index for different irradiances. And again, 500 gigawatts per square centimeter is pretty big, but again, with ultra-fast pulses, that's really not uh, all that huge. You can see that when you turn on and off the uh, pump pulse, you see a change in index of 0 0.1. Remember I said before, it's typically 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5. Now we're getting to regimes where it's not really per perturbative you get a huge change. The other thing that we see is the dispersion of the nonlinear refraction is also extremely large. And if you've got very dispersive material, then, then that tells you that the, the, the group velocity or the group index is changing quite a lot. So what we find is you can actually calculate that uh, with, again, just 300 gigawatts per square centimeter, uh, you can actually change the group index of a material by 0.7. So these are huge changes, and so that made us think about, well, can you do optical switching, uh, not by turning on or off a beam, but at causing it to arrive at different times. And there was work done by Mohammed Islam many years ago uh, on ways to use nonlinear optics to change the arrival time of a pulse so it doesn't appear within its uh, uh, time window that's expected in a telecom system. So that, that's something that we're still working on that we haven't quite done. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that's enough. The, the, the only other thing I was going to say is we, that we've been looking at epsilon near zero materials. Uh, so we're looking at indium tin oxide, and uh, indium tin oxide has a point of where the, the uh, as many materials at the plasma frequency or near the plasma frequency, the real part of the uh, dielectric constant goes from negative to positive, and so it goes through zero. And at that point, you get some interesting interactions happening. And uh, uh, it's called epsilon near zero, but it should really be called epsilon imaginary because although uh, the real part is zero, the imaginary part, which gives you the loss, is still fairly large. So we're restricted to very, very thin layers of indium tin oxide. But what we did was look at our beam deflection measurement and with Z-scan, this is work that Natalia did, and uh, basically, uh, so with the Z-scan, what we measured was the effective nonlinear index. Uh, so that this is, well, this is the, the index change that is induced by a pump on a probe. And if we turn up the irradiance uh, enough, but well below the damage threshold, we see a change in index of about one. So again, very, very far from perturbative. In fact, it's interesting because the linear index is about 0.3. So by turning on uh, the, the strong beam of light, the weak beam of light is seeing the index change from 0.3 to 1.3. So this was measured using Z-scan. We uh, did the same thing with beam deflection. Our radiance wasn't quite as high there, but you can see a very close agreement. So this is something that is real. We did some other measurements on it. We just published that uh, fairly recently. And uh, why you get this is still a bit of a mystery. Uh, people fret over being at epsilon near zero. But the fact is, what we find is even when you're not at epsilon near zero, you just get a big effect. And what we're doing here is we're just redistributing the, uh, the free carrier population. And those redistributions are enough to give you a very, very large change in the refractive index. So there's a lot of stuff to be done here. 
we're just beginning. But again, the main point is this is a huge effect, but it's in a very, very thin piece of material. So although you get a large index change, the phase shift that the index can induce is maybe about pi. Uh, if the material is any thicker, you can get a bigger phase shift, but uh, the loss is going to be uh, too big. And so that's the problem. There's always a catch with these things. So uh, you can't really uh, have your cake and eat it too, as it turns out. So anyway, just summarize. We've done a detailed study of 2 photon absorption in semiconductors over many years, as I, as I, sh I showed you. And uh, eventually, we find that you actually get, can, in some cases, get very, very large optical nonlinearities if you move to the non-degenerate case. Uh, you can do sensitive infrared detection uh, and imaging. And some of that work is still going on in other groups now with uncooled large gap materials. Uh, we can see 2 photon gain. Whether we see, do anything practical with that or not uh, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, and uh, well, I didn't, I didn't really say much about the non-beam deflection method, but using that, we were able to see very, very large changes in uh, index in semiconductors. And uh, finally, indium tin oxide turns out to have huge optical nonlinearities but at the penalty of large absorption. So uh, with that, I'll just uh, finish. This was, uh, uh, as I said, a, a, a group of effort over many years, uh, particularly my colleague uh, Eric van Strijland, who uh, drove a lot of this work over many years. And Eric actually graduated from uh, University of Arizona uh, probably before most of you were, were born, I guess. Uh, not, not from optical sciences uh, center, but he was actually a physics graduate. But he worked with uh, Marlon Scully and uh, Rick, Shoe Rick Shoemaker. So, yeah. So, uh, so that's Eric there. There's MG Swallow was in the group as well. He was the first director of Creole. So actually, the the first director, uh, the second director, and the first dean. And the second dean isn't here, and here's the third dean. So, and then you can see uh, a lot of people. There's Mansur Sheikh Baha'i. This was at Eric's retirement uh, uh, event. So you can see some present students, some past students. I remember I said you'd see this guy at Tai Wei uh, a little bit later. Well, that's Tai Wei after uh, uh, a few years after he graduated his, his PhD. He came back to see us. So, so uh, I guess I'll uh, uh, stop there, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>